What's it all about? What? Everybody's dead. I feel like a dinosaur. Oh, I know how people think of me these days. Old-fashioned, outmoded. Well, not after this picture, they wouldn't. You can't change your whole lifetime with one picture. Well, what have you got if you quit? Oh, Sammy, what's the use? Mr. Boogeyman, King of Blood, they used to call me. Marx Brothers make you laugh. Garbo makes you weep. Warlock makes you scream. <laughs> and once I thought I'd be an actor. Oh, it's not that the films are bad. I've got bad. I couldn't even play a straight part decently anymore. I've been doing the other thing too long. Of course you could. And even that isn't the point. You know what they call my films today? Camp. High camp. Wait a minute, I want to show you something. My kind of horror isn't horror anymore. There they are. Look at that. No one's afraid of a painted monster. The only thing you've said that's right is about this. Which is why you ought to do my movie. <laughs> you don't play some phony Victorian heavy. You play a human being and you could play the hell out of it. If I were your age, I'd play it myself. I'm gonna go offer it to Vincent Price. This is the emergency podcast system. This is not a test. Movies are bombing all over the country. They are posing as movies you already know. They may already be in your theaters, your neighbor's home, or even your own. Do not panic. Specialists have been dispatched. They will help you identify these pretenders and defend you against this invasion of the remake. Please stand by for further instructions. Welcome to the Invasion of the Remake podcast. I'm your host, Jason Bishop, and with me today, as always, is Sam Stepanenko. Good day, afternoon, evening, whatever time you are listening to this. And Trish is swimming with the fishes. Again. Still. <laughs> Still. She'll be back. Mm, she'll be back by the time you hear this. Uh, she should be, yes. Yes. And she did watch last week's episode of Pete's Dragon, and she did watch Targets, and hopefully she'll be sending us some little extras, and I think we'll post it on our social media. That would be fun. Yeah. So if you want to hear the extras, you got to be following us at Invasion Remake on Twitter or Invasion of the Remake on Facebook. Yes, or Instagram. I think, it, I think Instagram. we should even post it there. Yeah. So now's a good time to start following us on our social media so you can get some extra content. These are like bonus features on our episodes. Yes. And it's not even Patreon, so you don't even have to pay for it like you would it's on Patreon. still, still 100% free. How do we do it? We don't. I take a loss. I pay for all of the hosting fees off my credit card. So <laughs> <laughs> Hobbies cost money. Yes. <laughs> Show your appreciation by liking and sharing with everybody you know. Please do. Please do. I thank you for listening. Yes. Today we're going to do something we've never done before. We're going to start this episode off with a little bit of a warning, because this tackles some heavy and disturbing subject matter that we're going to be talking about today. Something that's very sensitive and, um, in media and just in, in general with the public right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. So we're going to be talking about gun violence, and mostly towards this film, but we want you to be aware that we are going to be talking about these subjects, and some people are sensitive about these subjects, but sensitive subjects need to be talked about so fair warning it's the only time we're probably going to do it we're, we're already clearly labeled explicit on, yes on our content anyway um through our providers because we like to drop f-bombs from time to time but we want to give you this extra heads up because there's definitely some disturbing contents within this film that might bother some people and we're going to be having frank discussions about gun violence at some point it's inevitable in this episode uh, yes, yeah, and it, it's a really important part of this film, and, and we don't want to upset anybody, but at the same time, it's I think that what I think we have to say is important, too. 
Yeah, absolutely. As important. And what the film has to say is important, I should say. Exactly. This this film is still important. Targets from 1968 by Peter Bogdanovich. Which we've never covered before, surprisingly. Oh, he hasn't directed as much as I thought he had. He's it, acted a lot, though. I didn't realize how much acting he'd done. Yeah, well, honestly, I he was in The Sopranos so much, I actually, and he had directed an episode, but I thought he was far more involved on that show than he was as just an actor. Yeah. So... What do I know? Yeah. I, I knew him more. I thought I knew him more as a director, but apparently he, he's been in a hell of a lot more movies as an actor than a director. So. Yeah, and it's funny because when he does direct a movie, they're always amazing. Yeah, and this was pretty much his first. It opened up the doors so he could do things like well, the last This was his first show. feature film. Yeah. yeah um, he did a documentary prior to this, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, and it did. this one did sit on the shelf for a little while, though. So I think the last picture show might have actually come out first. Um, last what? Picture Show was 1971. Oh, okay. So I'm wrong. Okay. Yeah. But uh, Last pic- Picture Show, Paper Dolls, um, these all happened because he made this movie. Yes. And um, oh, what was the follow-up to Last Picture Show? I can't remember the name of it now. Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> I'll remember like 10 minutes from now. But yeah, if you haven't seen any of his films, you should because they are always beautifully shot, including this one. Yeah, despite the low budget, there's definitely, you can see there's a rawness to it. This yeah. is not... A well-made movie, but it's a well-thought-out one. It's got a, a pretty decent script overall. The story and screenplay was also by Peter Bogdanovich. The story was also by Polly Platt, who was a producer on Bottle Rocket. Yes. Which is another great low-budget movie. It's like this one. Even a film student level could probably achieve this um, with some vision. That's why I always said about Bottle Rocket, if you're an upcoming filmmaker, go watch that movie because that's something really achievable. Targets might be a little tougher because you you got guns and stuff uh, firing in public places, so you're going to have to get cops involved <laughs> yes, <laughs> to, yeah. to work those sets. And the co-screenwriter was Samuel Fuller, who went uncredited. He did assist very heavily in this movie, but didn't want credit for it. And Peter Bogdanovich actually uh, thanks him through character, uh, his own character, Sammy Michaels, that he plays within the yeah. film, which is a far more significant than I thought, because he's fairly low in the credits on IMDb. Yes. But, but he was, I would he say... He was one of the few I cast, actually. I only cast, like, like, four. Yeah, I'd say he was, like, third bill, Yeah, as far as, in my brain, uh, uh, third or fourth bill. Yeah, third or fourth bill, yeah. I only cast four characters, though, um, to mm-hmm. be honest with you, because the rest of them are kind of... In and out, Mm -hmm. but there's four characters that are in it a lot. Yeah, so his character Sammy Michaels was named after uh, Samuel Fuller, obviously Samuel, Sammy, I call you Sammy sometimes, Yes, and uh, his middle name was Michael, so Samuel Michael. So there's there's sort of a backdoor credit there. Yeah, so there's acknowledgement of his involvement and uh, how important that was for him, too. And I love how this film is semi-autobiographical for both one of our leads and for Bogdanovich. I mean, Bogdanovich is essentially playing himself in his vision for one of our two lead characters. Well, this is a Roger and Corman produced film, thus the measly budget of $130,000, which uh, Bogdanovich thought he could get, because AIP, uh, which was Corman's company, was going to release it. And he's like, well, I'd like to see if I can sell it to a bigger company. And Paramount, Bought it for one hundred fifty thousand, so Corman was happy. Of course, yeah, he made twenty twenty grand on the movie yeah. right away, yeah. <laughs> right off the shot. Yes, right and I didn't do any connections to Corman because we've done him so often. I, yeah, I don't either, especially with the producing. Yeah. He's there's so much of that within our body of work yeah. now of of our archives that I'm just trust me, it's like every fifth film. <laughs> yes, is, 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 is the... Whether we know it or not, and then we do the research, it's like, oh, God damn it! there's Corbett again. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah, because he's made so many films that didn't do very well, I shouldn't say do very well, but are, are, aren't as well known that mm. are worth looking at again. And I think this is one of them, because yeah. it did not do well. No, I can imagine it didn't. Uh, I, to be honest, even though we're going to remake it this episode, I still don't think it'd do well, because... People actively avoid things that are too real for them to face. Yes, and this, and this is would one, be one of those of them, yeah. uncomfortable topics. Even you know this this movie's fifty years old. Yes, it is. And by the time I got to the end, I was definitely it 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 left an impression. <laughs> it did. This is. I, I mean, I wouldn't put it on the same level as Peeping Tom from the same year. No, I mean yeah. this is nowhere close to being as well made. No, but. <laughs> It still had the same kind of impact on it, me. If it had 
that kind of quality filmmaking in there, the cameras, the higher budgets, and the more polish, oh boy, I bet you'd stand right up with the rest of them. Yeah, and I mean, this is on the list of 1,001 films you should see. Yeah. Right? Like, it's, it's mostly some... because of the s- story mm-hmm. and the performances. Yeah, the performances are good. I mean, the camera work's not great, but the positionings aren't bad. There's some some bad jump cuts and you can the ADR is pretty clumsy and there's some of that po- uh, Bogdan Bogdanovich's artsy shot stuff too yeah cuz he he does like to do that he got better at it yeah no it was definitely experimental he yeah. would have been well, I'm guessing he would have been in his 20s yeah. when he made this movie and clearly just a young filmmaker and kind of finding his way through but that's Corbin's a great place to work through that kind of that's stuff exactly because the, the script is good the script is really good yeah as I said, the performances are outstanding. Mm-hmm. Like are, are the four characters that I that sort of carry the film are all phenomenal. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, this was one of those films that I'm sure Boris Karloff felt like. Well, what I've read actually it was one of his favorite movies that he ever did. It was a different career path for him, even though he was kind of playing himself. This movie is really interesting because the movie itself feels like the movie Peter Bogdanovich's character, Sammy Michaels, is making. Yes. Yeah, it's... It's it's it's, 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 it's very meta. Yeah. It's very meta, especially with, with Karloff playing um, Byron Orlock, who is a, an aging horror actor near the end of his career. Mm-hmm. And in this movie, he actually has decided to end his career. Yeah, he, he wanted to retire. He felt like he was a dinosaur, mm. and the world had changed around him. It acknowledges that the world is changing, and the things that scare people in the films has also changed. And his his horror movies have become camp, and he he's not being taken seriously. So he's he's kind of done. Yeah, he doesn't feel his own worth anymore. Yeah, and it takes a long time for you to really get that. It's not until the very end of the movie where you understand what it was that was motivating his retirement. I'm still not sure even now. Somewhere in the middle, he explains all that with the, you know, Mr. Boogeyman, they called me. Yeah. Um, I opened the episode with that clip. I really love that clip, even yeah. though the ADR can, can, is kind of bad when it cuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little unclear until his, his essentially final line in the movie mm-hmm. right and even then it's left a little bit to interpretation i think his story which uh, i'll end the episode with the man from sumatra facing death in that story yeah. is part of what karloff is also seeing yeah. he knows his death is coming but not it's not there yet you know he sees death but nope not your quite your time yet yeah and he feels maybe it's too late to kind of resuscitate his career go out with a big something big, a big, bold statement. And he's like, yeah, you can't retrack your career with one movie. Well, but he we've, did. Se- we've he... seen in films that you can. Yes. And this it was a lot harder then. Yeah, it was a lot harder then. And the funny thing is this movie is, I mean, as you said, it's, it's sort of out of his normal genre. Mm-hmm. And I think this caps his career really nicely. Yeah. I mean, there's, it wasn't his last film. There was a few more that came out even after he passed. Yeah. But it would be one of his last. When he was shooting this movie, he was down to half a lung. Offset, he was on a resuscitator, just yeah. a, a breather, so he, yeah. taking oxygen, and he needed a cane to walk around. And yet, he still gave a great performance. Absolutely, yes, there's no question. I was, he was he was so strong. It was mm-hmm. actually really fun to see him in this movie. And I love the fact that they actually used real clips from his old movies. Yeah, well, that was part of Corman being yeah. cheap and all. Yeah. And so was, they open up with clips from the terror in this movie, and that was something like Corman. Insisted on. Insisted was, on with, with Bogdanovich. It's like, okay, you got to use clips from my other movie with him, The Terror. Oh, he owes me two days still under contract. And Karloff really liked the script. So he did the two days and did three more. Yeah. He was there for five days and he didn't, he didn't take any more pay other than the two days because he really liked the script. Yeah, because it's such a good script. The whole idea of using The Terror was to give you more Karloff time and his commitment to the film and the role really allowed them to flesh it out. So they actually ended up using less of the terror because they didn't have to. Yeah. Yeah. And he, overall, he's probably in the movie for a good half hour, which is great because I think his story is compelling, even though I don't feel the two stories coincide very well. You've got this other story happening at the same time. This movie feels like it's happening in real time a lot of the times, yeah. especially that uh, highway scene. So you have this young man who 
is part of this idyllic, almost white picket fence type of family. Uh, a very 50s family a rather very than late 50s, 60s. nuclear family, yeah. yeah. He's talks to his father and calls his father sir yeah. and he's very respectful and he goes out on hunting trips with his dad yeah. and there's stuff i've read that i didn't even get in the movie that this kid was had come back from vietnam there's there's only one clue to that in the whole movie where he's in his father's office and he's looking at the photograph of himself in vietnam okay that was the only clue that he was a vietnam yeah vet. i think we need a little bit more than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, because but, I, I think the intent, of, part of the intent of this movie was to address the trauma that Vietnam veterans suffered when they got home, the vilification and the hate that they received. For and for a lot of these young men, they didn't volunteer; they were drafted. They didn't have a choice. Yeah, and they still got treated poorly when they returned. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. it was a lottery. They would pull a month and pull a ball, and if it was January sixth, and you were born on January sixth, you were going to Vietnam. Yeah. Exactly. And that's very timely now as well. I mean, we don't have, they don't have the draft in the United States anymore. But this unyielding hate that people have for certain groups of people, whether it be Vietnam veterans or Iraqi veterans or somebody of a different color or different religion, this unyielding hate is still a thing. Mm-hmm. And it's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, and I'm not even sure if it's hate if it's more than a fear. And that's part of it, too. Is uh-huh. I, you're right. Fear is part of it. But it's still ridiculous. Right? Oh, absolutely. It's still timely, even though it's 50 years old mm-hmm. in, in that sense. Yeah, and like, there's so much of this movie that still plays today because, fuck, it it's still happening. Yeah. If anything else is happening more, it, it is happening more on almost on a daily basis. Yeah. Right. And we haven't touched base on the, on the theme that's, that's where we're concerned that make, will make people uncomfortable mm-hmm. is well, one of the two, our two sort of central characters, Bobby is suffering from some sort of trauma. He is broken and right? he knows something's wrong. He even tries to talk to his sister about it. His, his sister or his wife? Oh, his, his, or his wife. Yeah. I, for, for a while there, I thought it was his sister. Because there's that and odd thing where they're living at his parents' home. Yeah. But yeah, he's he's broken and the, the very first, like the very first time you see him, he's looking down the scope of a rifle at Byron Orlock, our, uh, the character played by Boris Karloff. I mean, from a gun shop. He's, pick, he's, he's yeah. buying another weapon of, with a cache of them already in yeah. his trunk. And, I mean, that's, that's another thing that we want to talk about in there is how easy it was for him to buy these weapons. Yeah. Right. Uh, before we do that, though, let's run the trailer and catch some people up. It's more about Bobby in this trailer than Karloff. They don't, they don't even mention him in this trailer, but that, I'm glad we got to talk about him at the forefront of this because they, I think these stories get equal time. Yes. We thank you for the food we're about to receive in the Lord's name. Amen. Amen. A typical American family at dinner. Mom and dad, their beautiful daughter-in-law, and their only son, Joe, a homicidal maniac. Harry! What are you doing? How's your dad? It's okay. There you go. Thanks a lot. What you hunting this time? I'm going to shoot some pigs. Targets, a movie about a war inside a man's head. Hey, what are you doing? Bogdanovich, the director of The Last Picture Show, takes you for a roller coaster ride through the canyons of a disturbed mind in Targets. What turns an all-American boy into an all-American killer? And we still don't know. 
<laughs> we, yeah, we really don't. Uh, we don't know what happened to him. There's no backstory on it. No, there's more information in that trailer than, about that kid than there was in the movie. Yeah, because they never really tell you what what broke him. But in case you didn't gather from the trailer, Bobby, uh, the the younger character in the film, he is struggling with something and ultimately ends up going on a killing spree. Mm-hmm. And you don't even see him really break. It's just this, yep, today's the day. Yeah, well, he plans it. He, I mean, no, it's very planned. Yeah. It's very, very he, planned. He scouts the the oil tower and I purchases a, an awful lot of weapons and lunch and lunch. Yeah, because it just feels like he's up there playing a video game. He's having a good old time. It doesn't feel serious to him, which just adds to the tension of that scene. It does that. That and there's there's the first time you see him where he's looking through the scope at, at Byron, like he, it's almost foreshadowing. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, well, no, it is foreshadowing. Uh, and then there's that scene. Yeah, because where... those two are going to inevitably meet near the, the end of the film. That's right. And then there's the one scene where he's out there. Him and his dad are out shooting at cans mm-hmm. and targets and all that stuff. And he sights down on his father and, and you see his finger tightening on the trigger. You can see that there's almost like whatever happened to him made him enjoy killing. Mm-hmm. Like he, he discovered something in himself where, where he enjoyed that aspect of, of being a soldier mm-hmm. and he misses it somehow yeah and again not enough of that is made clear no, about but his past that's kind of what i inferred from it yeah is that he discovered something in himself that isn't healthy and she should have been able to get help for but instead he acts on it when he does try to talk to his wife she's got to get ready for work and and go and you get the feeling that maybe just maybe if they had had that discussion that day then maybe that the rest of that movie wouldn't have happened i think that's what it was was trying to tell us yes yeah right but instead it's it does lead to the final events which only happened in like the last 25 minutes of the film like it's a long lead up to it yeah this movie's fairly short at 90 minutes but it does take a while to build up to that point where he is starts indiscriminately shooting at people on the highway yeah. which is a horrific scene like it was it really is. uncomfortable to watch it is from one standpoint i was like well you're targeting the people through their windows and a moving object you would have missed every time but i can see why they would do that for general audiences just because it has a better effect for the audience if it's the target's actually on what he's shooting at yeah even though that's not the way it works no. <laughs> yes and, and they, they they actually mentioned that in but, some of the notes that i read on the movie yeah yeah What's interesting about it, like, he's not a perfect shot. He's a really good one. Yes. But he doesn't hit every shot. And we're so far away because we're over his shoulder and seeing it from his point of view. We're not hearing the chaos. You might hear some screeching in the background, but you're not hearing the screams. and uh, Which makes it actually more uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, I mean, and if you didn't notice, there's no music in this movie. No, there's none. So that also adds to the realism of the moment and the discomfort that you feel uh, through most of the movie yeah it's a very discomforting movie if you feel up to it i would recommend seeing it yeah that's part of what karloff's story helps is he's just a surly old horror actor and it breaks the tension there's some really great moments of levity when byron and sammy get drunk together yeah (laughs) when they wake up next morning next morning in bed together (laughs) <laughs> but, I wish I wish his girlfriend Jenny was like, "What's going on yeah. here?" <laughs> yeah, honey, it's not what it looks like. <laughs> yeah. But there's that great scene where where Karloff sees himself in the mirror and does the jump start at, him, at himself, like, oh. <laughs> which was improvised. So I mean, again, just goes to show what, how talented Karloff really was. Right? Mm-hmm. He, sees, he sees his moments and takes them. Yeah, and that wonderful man from Sumatra story that he tells to the radio jockey. At the beginning of the movie, he's like, I'm done. No more uh, no more movies. I don't want to look at a script. That public appearance, cancel it. Yeah, him and his agent and, uh, and the studio are uh, fairly at odds for the beginning of the film because he's so stubborn about this decision he's just made. Yes, yeah. I and mean, they're talking about suing him. And, and, and he and doesn't care. He doesn't care, no. He's, he's he thinks done. thinks it's funny. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the only thing that he feels at all bad about is his assistant, Jenny. Who yeah. is, I think, our fourth build lead, I would say. Yeah. Because she plays an important part in the movie. Because she's a sounding board and his assistant and his yeah. friend. You know what I loved about that? Her in general, like, she was... I just liked her character in general. Yeah. But 
here is this Asian character as assistant to Boris Karloff from England, shooting American movies, dating a Caucasian man. This is 1968. Yeah, it was very forward I mean, forward-thinking. this is not a big thing now, but this is 1968. I'm like, hey, good on you guys. Yes. Yeah, no, and I, I did enjoy that. I'm like, this is really nice It's just to see mm-hmm. that, that they were already looking at interracial relationships and, and casting Asian actors as Asian, as Asian characters. And there's this great running bit between Jenny and Byron about how she's teaching him Chinese. I love that. They had this dynamic, right? And like I said, and I, and I do believe that they were friends to the point where they could argue and he could say mean things to her <laughs> <laughs> that you would say to a friend, not to an employee. Yeah, right? no, she she often saw through Karloff's bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, because she'd been with them obviously long enough, and and there were these moments where she kind of got this sort of glimmer in her eyes. It's like Byron's fucking with everybody. I don't think she understands what's going on in his head. Oh no, she does. There's a, a point in the movie where she, where she. Oh, that's said, right. When said, she gives a bitch and them out yeah. for, for why, why why aren't you telling people why you're quitting? Yeah, right, right. Because they've had the discussion. Yeah, right. Uh, but she respects his wishes and keeps quiet. Again, part of their friendship and their relationship as employer and employee. But yeah, I, th- I I would actually have would like to have seen a little bit more of her in the movie. Yeah, uh, and that's be- something we could change. Like, I feel like this movie could lend itself well to being a little longer. You know, I don't think the tension would break too much at even two hours. I I, I would agree with you on that. It'd give us a little more character. Yeah. Um, certainly with Bobby's character, you need to give a little bit more insight into why he's broken the, the way he is. Yeah, and I want to see what's going on with with Orlock in general like what's led to this decision maybe it is because he's near the ending of his life and he's sick or whatever because yeah. Karloff certainly was yes right. and yeah I mean you could certainly use that as a motivation or I mean I kind of like the ambiguity of his reason mm-hmm. for leaving but at the same time you could give it maybe a little more for people to just sort of infer their own things out of it a little bit better yeah well I I'm honestly like with Bobby too there's just something about some average dude going on this spree that's really scary and yes. that's part of the commentary on here this is not a horror movie we're covering this is a thriller with a actor who is in horror movies yes and here's a character with bobby who's far scarier than anything that actor has played oh, by all means yes by, yeah, that's absolutely part of the commentary yeah. right and this guy looks like an insurance salesman which is his supposed job in the in the movie He's clean cut and he's well dressed and he's very normal, almost average looking. Yeah, and probably from a fairly respected family within the town because people know them. Yes, yes, right. I mean, when he goes into to buy his last batch of ammunition, mm-hmm. they say hi to him, but they, they call him by name, and he asks if he can put the ammunition purchase on his father's account. And they'd be known in the store if they're avid hunters or whatever yeah. and we do see the animal heads on the wall and stuff yeah and that's where uh, this is actually a good segue into to one of the things that's really important in this movie was with the show they show specifically him going to multiple gun places to buy weapons mm-hmm. right showing how easy it was especially in 1968 but it's not changed that much in 50 years where somebody can go purchase long guns quite easily from multiple stores so that you have could have more long guns than maybe you should have quite easily without anybody knowing because he just he kept making he just made the rounds and went to all these different stores to buy the weapons he wanted right i mean certainly handguns and and automatic weapons and so on, or semi-automatic mm-hmm. weapons are much tougher to get but i know that there's different rules in different states regarding long gun registries and and all that stuff but we don't even have a long gun registry in canada mm-hmm. right so, so anybody can own as many rifles as they want which is quite terrifying in reality mm-hmm. right? I mean, this guy had a small armory he had handguns and several rifles with with the viewfinders with scopes and yeah scopes yeah. and it was pretty scary just when he opened the trunk it's like oh boy and that's part of the tension too you see all those weapons and you know something bad's going to happen in this yes. movie yeah and yeah if, and and we had a sort of pre-warning as to what the content of this movie was before watching it and it was still uncomfortable Mm-hmm. Right, but if if you were to be in like a new audience listen and not heard or not seen anything about what this movie was about, you would be going, "What's going on? What's going to happen?" Mm-hmm. Right? And Bogdanovich took this script from the headlines. Yes, like, there was a, a sniper in a similar situation in 1965, yeah. but I could say 73, I could say 80s. 
because say 2019. I could say last week. Yeah. Um, that's that's how often this happens. Yeah. So, and that's what's really quite terrifying is that what's happening in, in America right now is not a new thing. And I, mean, I shouldn't even say America because it, it it is a worldwide phenomenon. It's just that it happens so frequently in America. Mm-hmm. And, and we're not criticizing America. It's just a fact. You know, you watch this movie and you realize it's 50 years old. And you're like, what does it take? What does it take? Yeah. Well, when I mentioned this to you, you hadn't even heard of it. No, I had not. No. No, and, it hadn't. Been... And yet it's on the thousand and one movies you, you should see before you die. Yes. So there's something here. Like people should know about this movie or see it. And if nothing else, out of an educational standpoint of like, hey, when do we say no more? Exactly. Because it, it, everybody's acting like this is. Well, I shouldn't say that. It, it, I mean, it's been an issue and it's been in the media. And people in the United States have been fighting for better gun control for a long time. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and I urge you guys into your elections. I, I don't want to get too much in the soapbox, but vote for somebody who doesn't get funded by gun lobbyists. Yes. Yeah. Simple. Right. And I mean, I, I, I do know that we are seeing a change in the climate. I mean, the NRA is, is now a, is becoming a, a less powerful organization within the United States. They're suffering their own issues and own scandals and their own issues within their own political structure that have weakened them. And that's not a bad thing. No. It is not a bad thing. I believe that people have the right to own a weapon, but I think that that needs to be controlled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's far more legislated here in Canada, and it's still probably too easy. Yeah, as I mentioned, the long guns in particular, yeah. right? Where where we did have a registry where you had to register your the serial number on your rifles, mm-hmm. right? Which made sense to me, right? Because it, then it, you, you could raise flags. Well, this guy's got forty rifles. What's he doing with them? How much mm-hmm. hunting is this guy doing? Mm-hmm. Right. So th- there's there's something to be said for that. They're not saying you can't have them, but we're going to be watching. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I I'm not a big fan of the whole big brother mentality either. But there is a balance, and public safety. I mean, some like guys that. just some people just collect guns. I have a friend who's got a lot of guns. Yeah. <laughs> that scares me. I don't like guns, but he, he's got a lot, and I think he just likes collecting them. He takes them to the range sometimes, yeah. but he seems he's level headed. <laughs> yeah, and there are there, there there are some people who are enjoy firing a weapon and, yeah. and collecting them. And I'll be honest, there's a certain beauty to some guns. I, I, like when you mm-hmm. look at them, they're, they're, there's an elegance and something about something that's really intended to cause harm to a person or an animal. Or I understand the appeal, even if I don't share that appeal. That was a weird place to go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that that was our soapbox moment. <laughs> But it, I don't it, think it'll be the last one. It probably won't be, but it's, uh, it would, trust me, it would have been far worse if Trish had been here. <laughs> yes. But it is an important topic for this film. When I think about this film, I'm like, the only reason I want to remake it, because it it's not very well made to begin with, but it's a great script, and it's still a great script. Yes, uh, yes. And I, uh, the subject matter is important. Yeah. Right? Because it is a commentary on so many things. Yeah, I still don't think it would do well theatrically. It might do well as a critical darling. Yes. An Oscar type of film. If that film had been better shot, given a little more money and time, Karloff might have got a statue or at least nominated for one. I will say of all the Corman films I've produced films I've seen, this is probably the best one. There's no question to me that this is in terms of story and even production. Mm-hmm. I would say this is easily one of the best, not the one of the the best one I've watched that was at all associated with. Ah, uh, yeah, that's uh, down to some that quality that is in Bogdanovich and, but, Cor- and Karloff and, and Karloff for yeah. sure. But there's times where it's just like there's some cringiness to transitions and yeah. like I said, just things they they do badly. The yeah. film stock's not very good yeah. and it's fine. That's yeah. it. I mean, it's part of the era, and you made it for with a cheap studio. So, if it, they would added a zero to that with a bigger studio, but I doubt they would have hired Karloff to do it or Bogdanovich for that or matter. Bogdanov- well, Bogdanovich had no track record, yeah, none whatsoever. So, yeah, and like I said, it, it, and that's why I said specifically Corman films. Yeah, I mean, for a Corman film, this one's a bit, you know, Corman movies often surprise me for what they wind up achieving in yes. the film for very little. And, and I, that's that's part of Corman's success is is producing maybe not great 
movies. He must be a great salesman. It's uh, like, hey, do you want to do this movie? Um, I have a bag of chewing gum. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'll he, feed your dog next week. Yeah, he has a gift for getting the most bang for his buck, for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Th- there's no question. But why, why don't you stay at my house and swim in the pool? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then everybody does the movie, and they're like, wait a minute, I didn't get paid. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, there's there's some of that for sure. He he, he he was a genius of that, and yeah, you don't. I don't think people realize how much influence Corman's had on the film industry because he, you're like you said, like like every fifth movie, he's been. It seems like he's attached to somehow. Yeah, right. Like he started so many careers. And he's and, yeah, he's really good at pinching a penny. Yeah. Like the family, the sparse family home, which says something about it. That family as well. Bobby's family, well, the Thompsons. That was deliberate. Yeah, that was very, very deliberate. Like the use, the, the use of the color on the walls and the way it was, it, it was set up and, and it's, the it's small sparsely rooms. decorated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was very deliberate to to, to, get, to add know. some claustrophobia yeah. to that scene. What people might not have noticed is that room, that house, was just redecorated for Karloff's apartment. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hotel room right. again, saving a penny. That's. Yep. And they repainted it and redressed it. And yeah, and and off you go, and and <laughs> you, go. you can't tell. Really. You shoot from a different neck. No, yeah. you can't. No, yeah, no. and that's the thing. You okay? So there's a large portion of that movie that's happening in one location. Just it's redressed, yeah. and a couple key other ones. I mean, the problematic one is our final scene with the drive-in. Yes, because drive-ins don't exist as much as they used to. Especially near bigger cities, anyway. Yeah. You still get them in the small towns, and I think they're a little more plentiful in the States than they are in Canada these days. Ours uh, blew up with the hub oil in town when, yeah. when we had this oil refinery that uh, blew up, and it took it took the drive-in with it. Yes, because they were right next door. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's unfortunate they never did rebuild that, because there's something to be said about going to the drive-in for a film. Yeah, and well, it shows you the different experiences that... In 1968, with the drive-in, they had a lot more families and stuff in those vehicles than probably we used to be the drive-ins, where it was more young couples. And yeah, well, it's funny because when they, they throw that scene of the playground underneath the screen, mm-hmm. I remember those. Uh, yeah, actually, I do remember yeah, seeing and that as well. That actually was, was also one of the things that made me uncomfortable because we'd already we, we'd already seen what was happening with Bobby and and the, the highway scene had already happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and then you and then he you fled see because kids. the cops yeah. were starting to show up. Yeah. So and he leaves in a hurry. He leaves guns behind and ammo behind as he's take. I mean, he's got plenty to still to go. Still, yes, but, still to go. But and that was a weird scene to me because he's he does escape in his vehicle, but a cop car does turn around and and tail him. But what information did the cops already have at that point? And you know, I had that same question, and because, I uh, the only witness he killed. Yes, and I think that it was one of two things, and I, I'm I'm, infer- I'm inferring because they don't really tell you is one they saw the direction he'd come from and and felt that that would was a logical follow up. Yeah, right, because of where he'd come out of. The other thing too is Bobby's established right at the beginning as a reckless driver. Hmm. He drives fast. He drives unsafely. So it may have just been one of those things where the cop saws it, sees him on driving driving unsafely, and is going to pull him over. Mm-hmm. But because of what Bobby's done, it turns well, into something else. Yeah, well, it also seems unlikely a cop would have turned around for this erratic driver if he was already being called to that scene. And that's the flip, yeah. the flip side. And the only thing that I could, I could think of is that yeah. because the driver of the police car saw where he pulled out of and went, oh, wait, that parking lot's right behind that where, where we think the shots came from. So yeah. We're gonna follow. We're gonna stop this guy. Uh, it could, yeah, just down to a cop with good intuition, which makes me wonder if maybe there needs to be another character somewhere within this film, uh, a third story. Yeah, it's, it'd be interesting to see how we could fit that in. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, it's not necessary, but you could have that middle ground story with with a cop or something. Yeah, I just don't know where, where, where you'd fit that in earlier in the film mm-hmm. because you you would never you wouldn't really understand why he's in there until the last act, right? I mean, as it is, it's really hard to make those connections between Byron and Bobby because the stories run parallel, but the, the only connection that you get in the early in the movie is when Bobby drives past the, the drive-in and reads the sign that says that Byron's going to be appearing there. Yeah. What if it's like, like a cop who's been assigned to protect 
Orlock in his public appearances. Mm, you might be able to make that fit it, make, yeah. make that fit in, yeah. But nah, that'd be studio hired security. Yeah. No, that no. wouldn't work. There, there might be something like there, there, there could be a presence maybe at that theater with such an open space. But we're probably not doing that now. Well, no, I actually had an idea for that. Okay. I had an idea for, for, for making that work because drive-ins are making a bit of a comeback, right? Okay. So he could be there to christen the reopening of the drive-in because that's what's happening in the movie. That drive-in is actually reopening in the movie. Okay. Right? It had undergone upgrades and redevelopment, and I don't understand why there was a hole in the screen if they'd done that. But... <laughs> but you can use the same same precept. It's like the reopening of a, of an old drive-in. Yeah, uh, because why was are, the door the under the screen not locked? <laughs> like why why was he able to get in there? Yeah, well, yeah. There's there's and that's one of the flaws in the in, in the film is is there's a few implausibilities. Yeah, Bobby climbs up above the screen and that he finds a sniper perch. So yeah. as the film kicks in he just anytime a light goes on in a car or somebody steps out he takes a shot yeah and i love the use the way that they establish the use of noise so the noise from the refinery interesting refinery movie Mm -hmm. theater refinery drive-in theater we just talked about that (laughs) um but yeah he's using the noise from the refinery to cover up his gunshots and it's not until after he shot a number of people that one of the people working the refinery comes out and then and then here's here's just the echo of them and goes well. What's going on here? And and ends up finding Bobby and getting shot himself. Yeah. Right. And then of course the. the and it, yeah, I don't know if you were like me, but it was like no, don't don't stop. Don't. Yeah. I was so into this movie. I me too. I mean, me too. Yeah. It, it's it, I, it, this is one of the movies where I it had my entire attention. Yeah. I'm not sure only why only one guy was working at the refinery, but that's all the budget could afford. Yes. <laughs> and it may have been one of those things where where yeah it was. A weekend and he was just there to monitor yeah uh, and that's most we, likely because yeah. um it didn't even the traffic on the highway was fairly light that's is, right thank god yes the, the use of the noise from the film itself mm-hmm. which was the terror well it was right? the so terror. It was one of carlos films and a corman film yep. and uh, and a very early appearance by jack nicholson yeah um i don't even remember seeing him but i definitely heard the voice yeah. This is interesting. So if you go back and watch The Terror, it's a really, really Jack Nicholson movie. And Corman actually suggested that Nicholson play Bobby. If that were the case, it, this is one of those times where, like, Bogdanovich fucked up. Yeah. Because if that had been the case, we'd all fucking know about this movie. Yes. But Nicholson's career was also exploding around this time, too. Yeah, it actually, about the time this movie was initially released, he would have been shooting Easy Rider. His his career bump might have happened differently or or later, but uh, we'd probably know about it. <laughs> yeah, probably yes. Yeah, and I, actually, I'd like to talk. We haven't talked about. Did the you cast hear Regis Filmin? By the way, on yes. The TV. Yeah. yeah. I'm like I could I couldn't believe he was active even then. <laughs> yeah, I, I know <laughs> that, he's, he's been around back. for a long time. Yeah. But yeah, we haven't talked about the cast at all yet. No, in fact, yeah. Normally, I follow that from the trailer, but let's let's do that. Of course, uh, I mentioned this uh, was starring directed. Story, screenplay, all Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, Peter Bogdanovich played Sammy Michaels. Tim O'Kelly was Bobby. And I am genuinely surprised that this man did not have more of a career because his, it, it was such a low-key performance because he yeah. didn't have a lot of dialogue, but you really felt the tension coming he, off this He guy. was a series regular on the original uh, Hawaii Five-0, yeah. but, but... No, he was only in the pilot. Was only in the pilot. Yeah, he played Dano in the pilot, and then he got re- and then it was recast. Was recast. With, yeah. Okay, well there you go. Uh, I mean, yeah, a lot of these people um, didn't have like big credits and, and careers, but you do kind of wonder why because there's some great performances, at least in our four main actors yeah. in this movie. Boris Karloff, also uh, very important in this movie. We have talked about Boris Karloff before, uh, episode sixteen, The Mummy. No, no. That was how the Grinch stole Christmas, oh. and episode sixty-one was the, the, the mummy. mummy. Yes, yeah. I missed the, the Grinch stole Christmas. That's okay. I uh, got your back. Yeah, it's okay. I might have a couple. You don't. So Nancy Husu, um, no, I butchered that. Was Jenny, and she was in the Wild Wild West, which was uh, yeah, kind of cool. We might yeah. have to cover that someday. James Brown, no, not that one. It was a series regular on Dallas uh, a little bit later in his career. He played the father, Robert Thompson Sr. He was the father of Bobby. Sandy Brown was Kip Larkin, the radio host. He was in Leprechaun 2. He was funny looking. 
He was a weird looking dude. He was a weird looking dude. Yeah. <laughs> Arthur Peterson was Ed Laughlin. He was the agent. Yeah. He, he no. He was the the producer. The producer. Yeah. Okay. He was the producer. Um, you might see him in the original Mission Impossible, not the film, the television series. Mary Jackson was Charlotte Thompson, which was Bobby's mother, and she was in The Exorcist three. Twice, apparently, because they re-released that, that re-edited version just last year, or actually earlier this year, I think. Oh, I didn't know there was a re- I know yeah. there's like yeah, there's, two versions of four. But. Yeah, no, there's a, they did a re-release called Exorcist Three: The Heretic. Oh, all right. I'll have to see if that's in my box set. Maybe I'll do that for 31 days. Yeah. Tanya Morgan was Eileen Thompson, which I, we've established was his wife, even though for part of the film I thought it was his sister. I'm like, wow, they're really close. Yeah, <laughs> creepily close, yeah. <laughs> And Monty Landis was Marshall Smith, and he was surprisingly in episode 180. Real genius. Was that the one? That, no, I got one more. Oh, well, I stopped there. So Okay. Because this <laughs> movie features an early appearance from Frank Marshall. He has no dialogue. He's just a kid in the phone booth. But we've oh, talked yes, about, he was. Yes. yes um, and, but he directed Arachnophobia, episode 145. Oh, there you go. See? You know, there's couple of directors that came out of this movie yeah. yeah and the only reason i did frank marshall is because i knew we talked about him before right i'll, I'll go see what i did actually you know. see it in there i'm like mm, i don't know if that's worth mentioning because i didn't even spot it yeah. so yeah no and i the only reason i mentioned it is because he, but well a connection. yeah i mean one now that i know what it was yes i do I did spot it because yeah. it was important yes yeah it was but yeah that was our our cast that was our cast. I mean, it was a much larger cast because there are a lot of, like, one-line characters in the movie. Yeah, and that's just it. Like, when we did our recasting, we really, like, I focused on Bobby, Orlock, Sammy, and Jenny. That was that was it for me. Yeah, yeah. I actually got a couple more, but yeah. I think. Yeah. No, that, I just did those four because they're the only ones who really drive the story. Everybody else is... is our general interactions that, yeah. that I mean they drive the story to a certain extent but they're not they're not the story yeah right? and those characters can be filled out with up and coming actors just like this movie did well except they didn't most of them didn't come yeah exactly that sounded odd but <laughs> sorry there's a distraction there <laughs> <laughs> Sam was distracted by this squirrel that jumped on my window so well it's because he's fighting with a crow <laughs> there's a crow and a squirrel having a Battle Royale outside Jay's window right now. It's an epic battle <laughs> of nature outside our door. <laughs> there we go. Now back to Rat, speaking of squirrels. Um. <laughs> okay, well, let's throw some ideas at this. I, like I said, the script's really tight, and I don't want to mess with it too much because I think Bogdanovich gets the point across really well already. In the end, absolutely. Um, and really motivation for both those characters. I want to change that opening scene. It opens with shots from the terror, and then we pull out to see Orlock in the studio watching the end of it, yes. discussing next scripts and things like that. I'd like to pull out, and maybe it's a different movie, like something earlier. Um, I mean, are we? I guess if we're doing it present day, we can pick the movie or whatever, but I yeah. want it to be about 20 years earlier or 15 years earlier, just to give a time frame where this kid grew up and I wanted to pull out and it'd be a young Bobby because that end scene in the original film, even though it adds to some importance for Carla, it's kind of silly yeah. without some context context. Yeah. And I, mean, I agree with that because there's a, there's a point in the movie where he's, where Bobby's excited that he saw Orlock. Yeah. Right. And then he makes a point of looking at the, the marquee for the drive in that it, announcing Orlock's appearance. Yeah. But you don't get the sense that there's a connection there really. Yeah. It, fe- it feels a little forced. It's one of the yeah, few things I, that felt forced. I want him to less of a fan and more somebody, this kid who was scared from those films. Yeah. Because he reacts, he's calm throughout the movie with doing these horrible things at shooting at people indiscriminately, with emotionless, until he sees Orlock coming out of his limo and just calmly walking up to him the same way he's walking in that movie. So he's looking back and forth and he sees Karloff in the movie and there's Karloff in real life and back and forth. And, and he's shooting wildly this guy who's right in front of him. He shouldn't have missed. And then he is either gun jams or he runs out of bullets. And then 
Karloff whacks him with his cane yeah. and disarms him and just beats him with his cane. And I love the fact that he ends up essentially being the him. hero, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, and he, it, yeah, the kid goes fetal. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, establishing that, that this actor's performance has had an impact on this kid. Yeah. Right? So there, there's a different type of drama there that, you know, this, he reverts for a moment back to this childhood memory of this horrifying man on his television screen yeah or the film screen and i do like that idea i just think it needs to be established earlier in the film and it's fucking frightening again when the cops pick him up and he's like i didn't miss that much yeah that was the last line in the movie and i'm like good god this guy is is genuinely broken Yeah. yeah and it just really really makes the movie like it's a really great like sort of pinpoint on the movie the whole point of the movie was this kid is really broken Mm -hmm. he wasn't even expecting to survive the day no No, there's this really interesting note that he leaves Mm -hmm. right saying yeah i've killed my mother and my wife and i know i'm not going to to get away with it but there will be more killing before i'm done and it's typed in red ink Mm -hmm. right i i think that that was a really interesting visual that they chose to use because the old typers used to have a choice of black or red ink. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he chose the red specifically um, says a lot about the character. Yeah. Because it's obviously not traditional and red's kind of that color you associate with blood and violence and, and all these things that he's about to do. Again, that sort of goes to show even in, at, as a at first time feature filmmaker, Bogdanovich really had a great sense of, of visual, mm-hmm. right? e- even with the budget he had. Yeah. No, I, I kind of like the idea of like that initial scene. We pull it out from the TV. Maybe the kid's like ducking behind his covers, and he's watching it with his family. And that way, you can establish when you see them older that that was the family we saw at the beginning of the movie. I think that's a better way to go. It doesn't diminish the movie in any way, and you you can handle Orlock's retirement scene slightly differently then, mm. right? I don't think it's necessary to be have them looking at the dailies from his newest film. Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. I think that ad- that adds some dimension to the character and really sets up that final scene really well. Like, really well. This is, this is, he's, that this is a source of childhood trauma for our character, mm. who's obviously suffered more trauma since. Yeah, I like it. Mm. And honestly, you wouldn't be doing a public appearance that so close if you're just watching dailies so so quickly so at least in today's structure so it doesn't make a lot of sense he'd be gearing up for press tour yes and maybe that's where the discussion comes where he's like i'm not doing it or whatever yeah Yeah. so we we could have him yeah yeah, gearing up for the press tour and 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 Mm -hmm. have it start with this opening of a reopening of a drive-in playing one of his older films Mm mm-hmm and it sort of it still ties it all together it still gives us this great venue for this the, the for the final act because that drive in really is the i don't want to say great setting for this type of thing because it's a horrible setting for this kind of thing but it's a fitting choice for it it works really well for the movie yeah and i mean thematically speaking this actor who was at the top of the game when he's doing this is now kind of degraded into these b and c movies and been typecast and is having trouble to escape it yeah. so that's kind of part of his story and maybe rather than doing a big red carpet this this kind of cheesier appearance would kind of make sense because this is something he needs to do to pay the bills yeah and given those types of movies he probably would have been sort of the king of the uh, one of the kings of the drive-in era right Mm -hmm. so to have that sort of have it reviving is a great counterpoint to the decline of his career too yeah i like where that goes i don't know if we pull it from because if we do a contemporary you could still pull it to the 80s when slasher movies and things like that were big or if we pull it back to the 90s then maybe his heyday was in the 70s oh i i my my casting actually works really well with today okay perfect mine does too so yeah. um yeah, it works really well with today but actually. yeah so i like that you think about the actors from those 80s movies yeah. now they're kind of at that yeah. age where yeah. karloff was uh maybe a little younger about 10 years younger but i think karloff was in his 80s when he shot this yeah he was pretty close to it yeah yeah my actor that i've picked is in his 70s early 70s but i think yeah, it still works i don't know exactly how old my actor is i just know that he's perfect i think he's um, 72 but yeah. i think he's also perfect yeah. So. Yeah. I may, we might even have the same guy who knows we might we might, <laughs> we might. <laughs> but i think that opening is important it establishes something with the kid that relates back to our actor because 
we want these seams to mesh up a little bit better because it does feel like almost two different movies that are happening yeah, it at times. Gives them a better connection because it's it, it is the one thing that really is missing is that is that connection between the two, but like where the mm-hmm. two these two parallel stories they finally intersect, but they don't. The importance of it isn't there. Like mm-hmm. you don't sort of get that sense of importance that this, it's important that they intersect. Yeah, in fact, I like the idea of your opening credit crawl being classic horror movie posters and marquees along with these horrifying headlines over history yeah from from this guy's heyday and we can kind of see this growth and collapse of his career as the world is changing because horror does that often horror has always reacted and changed to the way the real world is and what the real world reacts to yeah yeah for sure it's that is acknowledged within this movie, even though it's not a horror movie. It's something that you can embrace and, and should embrace and see how things have changed and how different and scarier the world has gotten. I like that. Yeah. And then lead into a scene from one of the movies from our horror actor, mm-hmm. whether it be a real movie or a fictional movie. Yeah. And that, that'll that be up to the studio. Yeah. I mean, part of it, I really wanted to use a real one, but it's like, okay, well, this actor's stuff is over with this studio, but the movie itself is paramount. Yeah. So I'm like, nah, I'll let them sort it out. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly <laughs> this, is, it. this is part of fantasy casting. I'll do it the way I want. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's funny. I knew who my Orlock was. Like five minutes in the movie, like, I know who I'm casting. I knew it before I started. Because yeah. I had an idea of what the, I knew what the movie was yeah. about. Uh, I knew enough about it. I had never seen it, but I knew enough about it that I'm like, oh, this guy could pull it off, no yeah. problem. Yeah, I see, and I, I always like to sort of see the see the at least part of the movie before I make any decisions. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it, it comes because I know the movie really well, but because this one was new to me, I wanted to wait and see. Yeah, I didn't write anything down. Yeah. I didn't commit myself until I actually saw the movie, because mm-hmm. sometimes I'll have ideas going in, and then it's like, oh, that's not quite what I thought it was going to yeah. be. So it does change your dynamic, and honestly, the horror actor is about the only one I thought was easy. Because we've done so much of it on this show. Yes, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, yeah, we'll, we'll save the rest of the casting for when we're ready. But <laughs> We're almost ready. Yeah, we're, we're almost ready. We've got, we got still got a bunch of movie here to work. Well, maybe not a bunch, because like I said, the script's good. Yeah, it's uh, just... If so, it's just, you throw a little bit more money at it to s- work out the seams a little bit, contemporize the, with the way the studios work. I mean... That's the way things worked in the 60s aren't the way things work now. No, for sure. In fact, if anything, they're busier and bubblier and two cell phones in any hand for an assistant. So. Yeah, exactly. One of the thing that I would not change at all is, I, I mean, there's this predilection now in modern filmmaking to be very graphic with violence. Mm-hmm. One of the things I really loved about this movie was how bloodless the violence was mm-hmm. because everything was so remote and, and distant from, from our our killer yeah right he didn't get to see he never really saw the effects he saw people falling but he never saw what it really what was really happening to them you could do a distance effect if you wanted to but it it's not necessary although at the same time it might add to an audience's discomfort if they saw a suggestion of a blood spot or something because you are so far away exactly so i mean you, i mean i don't want to go like completely wouldn't say no, completely bloodless so you want a certain amount of realism yeah and i don't but, really want it close up uh, although that won't that one scene where the kids staring at his dad in the car and the dad's dead next to the yeah. window as it pans over whoo yeah even though it's bloodless uh, exactly. which doesn't make any sense there's not even a hole in the windshield so maybe they get get a little bit more suggestion in there yeah. take a little more care but that says a lot yeah it works so well without being graphic and that's what I one of the things that made this movie really impactful yeah for I don't me want is, to see heads explode or whatever but you know you could see suggestions of that violence yeah and exactly but you don't need the, the over, overly graphic blood sprays that we yeah. get nowadays because trust me it's still disturbing all on its own yeah. without having to do that. Yeah, exactly. I, and I think it actually was genuinely more disturbing because, mm-hmm. again, because it really emphasized his distance from what he was doing. Yeah. There was no connection between the damage he was doing yeah. and his actions. Yeah. And at no point, like, and that's something the, the film's always got to be careful about. And I think Bogdanovich did a good job. And if a remake would ever happen, some it's got to be a director who's going to also do that because you can't glorify this. No. You've got to make the message has to be, this is awful. We need to maybe take a look at the mental wellness of our veterans or just anybody who buys a gun. It's like, hey, there, sh- there should be a closer look at anybody who buys a gun and whether they're even mentally fit to possess one. 
I, I, yeah, and I think that's part of what this movie was trying to, to convey even 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as far as sort of establishing sort of... I don't know if we need to know what sort of what broke this character, but you need to, do, we need to do a little bit more to establish that, that he is unstable. I mean, they, they, they do a good job of it in this movie, but I think they could have done a better job. You kind of get the feeling he's just going through the motion. This this feels like a family that's pretending to be a good family, a tight family. There is some of that. It's, it's almost like they're they're hiding their darkness. I, yeah, that, and and you, certainly by the fact that he calls his father sir, that he, I think that he resents the domination of his father, mm-hmm. right, to a certain extent. And and he, you know, I don't want to go into the cliches of an abusive home or whatever. Sometimes people are just nuts. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there and, aren't any triggers, and yeah. you can't explain it, and that's terrifying. And yeah, I think that that's a good point. Is is you don't want to, you don't want to go too tropey with what's mm-hmm. happened with him, right? Are I you, mean, there'll be that there'll there'll be this desire from any filmmaker to explain it and soften it and and make it a little more relatable to the audience. Oh, well, he was beaten as a child, and well, that makes more sense why he's all fucked up. Yeah, abused. No, and I, 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 I mean, I think that yeah, showing him in what most people would consider a normal, happy household, it again just adds to the impact of of the message. There's nothing wrong with his family. Mm-hmm. It's this man who's broken, and it was. We don't know necessarily know what broke him because let's face it. I mean, you'd you'd never really know what broke them. We had recently in Canada, we had those two young men who went on a, on a a brief killing spree up in Northern BC and, and um, ultimately took their own lives, but nobody's ever going to really know what motivated them to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that not knowing is again, maybe a little too real for some people, Mm -hmm. but it's a reality. And I think maybe leaving that fairly ambiguous might actually be a better way to go. Yeah, because of that ambiguousness, I the only connection I want to make is more to Orlock. Yeah. So there is some fears there, but what makes him do this? You can see those final like that's this movie isn't about his lead up to it. This is the day or the day before when this movie starts. Yeah. Like he's already made up his mind. Yeah, this is like it all happens within 24 36 hours. No. Yeah. Maybe. I want to fix the thing with the car where the cop car chases him and I figured it out. Okay. Is there's more than one guy working at the refinery, mm-hmm. and he sees him pull away in his car. He calls the police and says, "Yeah, I, I I saw a car pulling away from the refinery there. I saw him get in and I with with his bag of guns, right? It's yeah, a, it's a simple it's a simple fix. Yeah, you would think, especially modern day, there'd be cameras all over the yeah, place. Exactly, yeah. especially on something like a refinery. Yeah, or, although they'd probably see him going up. Yeah, you could you could easily explain that when when he when he's going in, he knows where the blind spot is, mm-hmm. but in his rush to get out, he runs through camera sight, right? Yeah, or he he just does a little more research and dresses the part. Yeah, makes it look like he works there. Yeah, I mean that's a, I, I mean that's a, an implausibility you can kind of work your way around. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, just explaining the, that it, really big one where why does that cop stop and chase him without adding a whole new character mm-hmm. um, and trying to fit him into shoe him or shoe him into the into the story? I think that's an easy fix. Is you you have security staff either from a, from a security desk or from a remote security or whatever, calling and saying, yeah, we saw the guy come over the fence, so I'm getting in his car with his license plate number. Yeah. Boom. It's a, it's a simple fix, 30 seconds of dialogue. I'm game for that. Yeah. It fixes that. What is, it, to me, is the biggest hole in the movie. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think we need a little more work on Orlock as well. For our movie, just because I wanted a nod to the man, I wanted, because Orlock is a reference to Nosferatu. Yes. Back to the founding of horror but i'd like to rechristen the character as karloff i think that's a good idea yeah Yeah. since he's not around to make his cameo um it just seems appropriate yeah we just we call him byron karloff instead of boris right yeah yeah i am totally down with that i i think just a a, it's a good nod but i feel like we we need to understand the man a little bit more and where where he is a little earlier in the film mentally as well where he's just like oh, i'm tired of making this trash and nobody's taking me seriously anymore and this is a terrible way to go out but it's, it's, uh, it's not going to get any better so yeah and i, I mean there, there's that point in the movie where he kind of does do that mm-hmm. but it, it could have gone just a smidge further mm-hmm. right I, I think that it you, should come out when jenny's yelling at him more or with, with, with the scene with sammy actually i think yeah. would be better because jenny already knows why he's leaving Right? right, but Sammy comes in and but Sammy's confronting him, and he's drunk yeah. and he's unruly, and he's and well. It, I think he's seen this man. He's idolized this man. He's written movies for him before, and he's finally 
As a movie, he thinks is worthy of the actor. Worthy of it. He, because in a way, I think he sees this man as a father figure. Yeah. And he also, I think he also understands, so yeah, he also understands subconsciously why he's leaving because he's been doing these low budget crap films when he's capable of so much more. Mm-hmm. And I think, and that's the, what the Sammy character really is to convey is I get you. I, I get your disappointment. I get what's happening to you mm-hmm. without ever saying it. Yeah. Right. That's why I wrote this script for you. Yeah. And there's that, there's, there's, there's this sort of constant reminder that Orlock's never read the script. Yeah. He didn't read it when, it when it was handed to him. He still hasn't read it by the end of the movie. He's never read it. Yeah. Right. That could be part of that final bit of dialogue well, from Karloff, here, right? Here's a thought that might soften the blow because, boy, when that thing ended, I was like, huh, kind of yeah. left breathless. Which is good. It is good. So, but I like to do another pan out right there with another audience doing a standing ovation for the film they j- just made about this script, which was... Because that's kind of what just happened. Yes. They just don't do it. Yeah, it's... it's this, is, this, this movie is the script that Sammy wrote. Yeah, like, like I said at the beginning, this is a very meta script. Yeah. Right? There's, there's, there's so, it, in a way, it does kind of just... It lets it allows you to breathe again. Yeah, it, it, without necessarily diminishing the impact of the movie. Yeah. yeah, I could see that working. I could see that working. Pulling out at the premiere... Who's to say that all didn't happen? But that that you can leave ambiguous yeah. to the audience because it doesn't lessen the impact of the importance of, and the message of that story, at least the the, the Bobby side of the story. No, the, because the the message is still there, and it right. gives uh, it gives us a nice roundabout happy moment that there there still was a future left uh, in the twilight years of our horror actor. So it gives you, despite all this darkness you've just felt, you have an uplifting moment with him. Yeah, because his, his, because his final line is pretty dark. I, yeah. mean, I mean, it's just... A, and I was just like, I wasn't happy leaving it there. Yeah. Uh, although, I did like Karloff's line after he beats the crap out of him. Yeah. It's like, what was I afraid of? Yeah, this is what I was afraid of? Yeah. Yeah, there's... And, and, and the, the pathetic nature of this coward. Yeah, and, and that's... And that's my one concern about about that sort of alternate ending with the, with the audience is, does that make that moment less powerful the old man who beats him with a cane is a, almost does it in its own right it, it does yeah i, I mean, i'm not even happy with how that plays out yeah. <laughs> as it is so yeah. i do like where the kid just kind of i think our opening it fixes that it fixes though. that a yeah. little bit yeah yeah unquestionably yeah if our actor's a little healthier maybe he can be get a little more physical with him yeah yeah i think so I don't know. I, I, I'd be happy with either ending, but I think I would just leave it with it where it is, but maybe add uh, one sort of last little bit with our Karloff character who's just saying, Sammy, where's that script? I think that would work really well without... Yeah, that's a good. That's good too. Yeah, because I, I think giving them the audience, it's almost spoon-feeding. Yeah. Um, and you, your closing credits could be something similar to the opening where I had this montage where it's like, okay... Where they're filming op- it? maybe filming it or just shows the opening advertisements for the film, yeah. like print ads yeah. and posters and marquees, big success yeah. awards yeah. to this film counterbalanced with the more violence. That's not ending. Yes. It's still yeah. out there. Yeah. It, this one guy has been caught, but it's still, the problem yeah. is still there. Yeah. The constant, the, the, the constant headlines. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I like that. I think that gives gives you sort of that again that, the contradiction of the two stories is it, so important, and that that just really emphasizes at the end, and still em- emphasizes the message. Mm-hmm. And part of this is a, like, yes, things happen in the world that are really dark and horrible, but you still got to live your life. Yeah, yeah, and look for those moments of brightness. Yeah, right. You can't yeah. grab onto to the darkness all the time. Yeah. No, I love the idea. Yeah. Karloff, Karloff returns in triumphant new picture, an Academy Award winning performances. And yeah, I love it. Mm-hmm. It gives us that happy moment as well, if you stick around for the credits, because everybody does now. You've been trained to because of Marvel movies. Yes. <laughs> and you don't even have to wait. It'll just happen within the credit crawl. Yeah, I like that. And I mean, we don't really need, to, with all that, we don't even need to change the middle of the movie. We just need to sort of. And not much. You know. Like I said, a lot of this works. It's just badly made. It's uh, well written. I think it's badly made. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that's maybe a little harsh. It's well made within the budget it had. Okay, I will give you that. For the budget it had, it is pretty decent. It's a yeah. decent watch for yeah. sure. Yeah. 
but given more money with that same script, this movie could have been way better. Oh, absolutely. I, I, mean, don't, is, I, I don't disagree with you at all. It's cut by amateurs. It's, I mean, there are times where it's just like my, my inner filmmaker is just like, oh, come on. This yeah. is awful. Like, you've got this great script and some great performances, and then you hack it up with these bad cuts and bad ADR. And I mean, the angles weren't even that bad, but the editing was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, like I said, I, they said, the film stock was terrible. Yeah. The audio was quality. It was terrible. I mean, granted, there was a lot of ADR, all that stuff on the tower. They didn't shoot audio on, so it was all inserted. What yeah. was there? The refinery noises and things yeah. like that. So they were completely building that soundscape. Yeah, and I mean, you could tell. Yeah, right. I mean, and you- yeah, and that's the problem. You can tell, even if you don't know anything about filmmaking, you can tell. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't bad enough to jerk me out of the movie. No, yeah. it, like I said, it had an impact on me. This yeah. is. A great movie made by Roger Corbin Studio, yeah. AIP. I mean, it really is. It's like an Oscar death race. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. here's this great movie made by the guys who made death race like it's, ah, what the hell it, 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 the movie itself is a contradiction it is right? it's I, just the, like oh god yeah. like another hundred grand man yeah yeah it wouldn't i don't think it would have taken much to move it from a great story in an okay film to yeah. a great story in a good film at least yeah i mean it's clearly made on the cheap yeah no there's no question of that you can tell by by the the way it was shot and like you said the ADR and the mm-hmm. edits are are definitely the weakest points of the film. Yeah and this is a prestige piece. Yeah. Like it it is something that would garner attention from the academy. Yeah no this uh, is given a good performance. Yeah. This should be in the class of of Peeping Tom. I I, I keep going to the back to that one cuz that was a yeah. benchmark for me in terms of But that one's incredibly well made. It is and it, but uh, that's exactly it. It's incredibly well made and it's a, my I, my benchmark for movies made in this area mm-hmm. because it just is so stellar and stand out stands out so so clearly, mm-hmm. right? This had that potential to be one of those movies. Yeah, as far as thrillers go, it's right up there and it's the probably the one of the best thrillers you've never seen. Yeah. Most people don't know it exists and uh, hopefully if nothing else we've made you more aware of its existence and the relevance of the film still holds a lot of merit. A lot of merit eh? uh, because more we, than it should yeah. 50 years later. Yes. Yeah, I I mean our treatment of veterans is still not improved in 50 years. Our, our handling of gun gun laws has not improved in fifty years. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, laws that were written in the old west. Yeah, prior to prior that. to the old west. Yeah. Like time has changed, the world has changed, and uh, those those laws should change along with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, let's get some recasting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because we're the soapbox was starting to go glow again. Yes, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. get on it. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah, I think we're, 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 we've we've established how we feel about that. Yes, but we gave you fair warning. All right, I'll start out. Give okay. give Sam the uh, the tale today. Okay. All right. For my casting, my Byron, my Orloff now Karloff, Byron Karloff, is going to be Robert Englund. Okay, I can get behind that you can see that yeah. yeah i mean he's in his 70s i mean he's he's got a lot of energy i hope i have half that energy i don't have half that energy now yeah. <laughs> but he, he'd be a very different guy but i i think he could uh pull it off and especially given some a movie with meat on its bones um there are some hidden gems in his own career that uh i may have mentioned in 31 days of horror but but there's he's got some hidden gems where you could really see him his acting chops. Yes, and he is a good actor. He is. Yeah. Yes. For Bobby, I went with KJ Appa from Riverdale. Okay. I still wanted that clean cut look. And I did cast Eileen, his wife, because <laughs> it was you wanted another, to? Because I wanted to, because I'm like, ah, well, I got one Riverdale actor. So I went with Madeline Petch from uh, Riverdale as Cheryl because I just wanted to see Archie killed. <laughs> Which sounds horrible in the context of this movie, but... <laughs> yeah, and we didn't just, we didn't say anything about the fact that, yeah, he... Well, actually, I did. It's a, quite a horrific scene, even though, again, it's quite bloodless. Mm-hmm. The scene where he kills his wife and then his mother, mm-hmm. and then he and lovingly... He repositions He them. lovingly takes him to... And, and rests him in the bed and... and mm-hmm. Uh, covers up the blood like so there and that's really telling and i, I didn't was, think so much about his brother though no that was the delivery guy oh it was the delivery guy yeah he looked they looked so similar yeah um yeah it was that's <laughs> i was the, wondering where that guy came from like, who yeah, was that yeah dude? he was he was delivering groceries oh so yeah. yeah he just left him crumpled in a corner yeah yeah no but but he for the people he loved he did he took the time to put them in their bed covered up the bloodstains with a towel 
Yeah. Right. Like so, he is very meticulous. Yeah. Like when he, he was laying out his weapons, everything's clean. I mean, but the house tells you that. Yes. And the way he presents himself and and what he wears and that sort of thing, he's in a way he's a very much American Psycho guy, just in the sixties. Yeah. One more thing to I can interrupt you casting. I'm sorry, but one more thing because we talk about his his job, but he's out shopping for guns when he should be working. Mm-hmm. I think maybe with that, well, when you said he was insurance, I'm like I don't didn't even know that. Yeah, they talk about it in the movie. Okay, um, I just didn't go. Out Onto him, like yeah. you never see him do normal things exactly and i think that's important is, is the fact that he should be working but he's not yeah and, and i think that might be the breaking point maybe mm-hmm. the breaking point is i think he lost his job right or right. maybe we should see that yeah i think that that would that would just give us that last piece that we need to sort of give the audiences something to grab onto without spoon feeding it to them I'd, I'd agree with that. Yeah, that's I'd, sort of the falling down syndrome. Yeah, I do like that. Okay, continue with my casting. I went with Olivia Cheng as Jenny. Uh, she was most recently in Deadly Class and Warrior. She's also been on Arrow, Flash, and Marco Polo. Okay. Robert Sheehan as Sammy. Okay, I can go with the guy behind that. Yeah, I just wanted this guy who felt who who's a good talker because if he's writing scripts and pitching in the studios, he's got to be a good talker. He's got to be a good pitch man. Yeah. And Robert Shane can talk his ass off. Yes, he can. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he uh, most recently was in, in the Umbrella Academy. Great Irish, Scottish, Irish, yeah. Irish actor. Overseas audience might remember him from The Misfits, which is best part of The Misfits great. and best part of Umbrella Academy. Absolutely. For Robert Sr., Bobby's dad, I did cast that because why not? Peter Bogdanovich. There you go. (laughs) And yeah, for my director, this one's going to be important. You need somebody who can really grab on to the character aspects of this and still give you that tension that this thriller has and leave you in that uncomfortable place at the end of the movie. So I went with He's kind of a rock star at this point in the in the horror world, but I think a, there's a lot of thrillers. They're almost as much thrillers as they are horror movies. Mike Flanagan with his upcoming Doctor Sleep, uh, Hush, Oculus, Gerald's Game, Haunting on, of Hill House. That's all Mike Flanagan. Uh, he's very good at that, and uh, I think he'd be a great person to do this film. I would agree with that. There you go. I would agree with that. It's not who I went with. But I agree with it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So mine's going to be quick and dirty, um, yeah, or quick I, and easy. I've been getting in trouble for saying that. I don't. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, you know, I, I, I had my four, and then I'm like, ah, oh, I'll give a couple more because I had because it, it felt like you should have more. But yeah. I, I'm like, no, I'm going to stop at four because these are really the important characters in the movie. Yeah. So for my Byron, I went with Sir Anthony Hopkins. Hmm. And I think that you could go back to, I mean, even Hannibal Lecter. If you want to talk about a character that could really affect a young person i think he'd do it oh yeah and i think he'd really good i I think that character should be somebody who is associated with horror or at least thrillers of that nature yeah and And i i I wanted to capture the elegance that karloff brought and that for me that was hopkins i'm like right the characters he plays is very different than the person he he appears to be Mm -hmm. i thought that's why hopkins popped into my head but i like robert england too for my bobby and solely because of his performance in maniacs i went with jonah hill okay i I haven't seen the movie so it's It's on netflix yeah miniseries but yeah he the, the haunted gaunt look i think would work really well for bobby okay because i think that his look could sort of as he deteriorates over the course of that 32 or 36 hours, I think, yeah, the, the thin Jonah Hill looks really good for that for me. Okay, I'll have to go with you on that yeah. one. I don't, I don't know. I can't see it right now. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, for my Jenny, I went with Karen Fukuhara, who was in Suicide Squad. Okay. So it's Katana. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Jenny's now Japanese, and she's teaching Byron Japanese. Um, right. For my Sammy and my director, I went with Jordan Peele. Nice. I figured, let's keep the meta. I tried, and I just I couldn't get it to work. I, I even wanted to have a black actor for that part. It just wasn't working in my brain somehow. I was trying really hard. It, yeah, it, I, I knew right away when I realized that Sammy and, and, and was played by Peter Bogdanovich. I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm doing the same thing. And I'm like thinking, character-driven horror films? Who's like becoming? Oh like yeah, the, he's he's definitely got it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's a little bit older than the Sammy character, but yeah. in context with the movie 
it's it's early in his career right now too as far as a, mm-hmm. being a film director yeah there's no age cap on when you can enter the industry no. i mean it might make it harder if you yeah. enter in your 40s yeah. but he was already there in a different capacity yeah. so yeah but it, like, in terms of being a filmmaker like a director yeah. and so on he, absolutely I, he's, he's, no you know, I, so. I mean i i dig it yeah. yeah and that was my cast and director yeah no that's simple and clean simple, yeah. clean and yeah. that's kind of this movie as well yeah. so i think we both got good cast yes uh, I think more than anything else, it's this movie. The only reason I thought about remaking it was the message should get back out there. Yes. It's just as timely as it ever was. Yeah. It's unfortunate that it keeps coming up. This movie was actually completed in 67, but didn't actually get put in theaters until 68. So it was actually made prior to the assassinations of Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King. But it was released afterwards. These days, when something like that happens and there's anything that's in production that might relate to it that gets pulled. Yeah. Now, if it glorifies violence, I can understand that. Save it for a little while. Let the audience breathe for a little bit yeah. before you throw something like that at them. But if there's a message like that and it just happens to happen, let the movie roll because it's even more powerful at that <laughs> point. Now, will people go see it is another matter because we have such a knee-jerk reaction to things these days. Oh, how dare you? But, I mean, usually the people who complain are the ones that never saw it. And that's usually the case. And this is one of those movies where, like you said, the message is still timely. And I don't generally don't think there's anything wrong with tackling this subject matter in a mature, sensitive, tactful way. And I think this movie did it. This movie did it. Yeah. And, again, that's something... A future ma- a filmmaker, if this ever came up for a remake, has to have equal tact yes. to what Bogdanovich did. Yeah, because... I mean, I mean, Bogdanovich is still out there. He could just re- redo this movie he, better. He, I, for sure, yeah. Because, I mean, at no point does this movie glorify what's happening with Bobby in any way. Mm-hmm. Like, at no point. No. I mean, that, and that's part of why it works so well is because it's... Even though it's takes so long to get to it but when it's happening you are genuinely uncomfortable yeah they don't really give you much like even his interactions with his family and stuff feel kind of dry and forced which adds to the disturbing nature of the character yeah because he's not connected to anybody no there's definitely an emotionlessness about him yeah and it's truly surprising that the actor who played bobby did not i said it already but i'm saying it again did not have a, a more substantial career because for as little as he had to work with, he really does convey that disconnect and mm-hmm. that emotionless really, really well. And it was really hard not to cast Matt Damon in that role because, I mean, I saw him and I'm like, oh, look, there's an easy casting Matt Damon. I'm like, no. Matt Damon about 10 years ago. Yeah. I would have done that if it had been 10 years ago. Yeah. They, they, had, they had that same sort of all-American clean-cut look. Yeah, absolutely. Right? But that's, and that's why I went the way I did because I wanted somebody who maybe would be a little different. No, that's cool. We didn't reinvent the wheel with this one. No. It's just one of those cases where here's a forgotten movie that is really good and could be done better. Great script, not so great production values. Yeah. At times, I do feel that the Karloff stuff bogs down the thriller part of the aspect, but usually, for the most part, I was into both stories, but one would distract from the other. There were points where that happened, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There were points where that happened, and I, that certainly would be, I think, has a lot to do with production, where they they just didn't have the time to tighten that up. Yeah, and that's just it. They need to spend a little more time, better transitions, yeah. and uh, better better segues to characters, and more crossing and, of paths, and, and better introductions to the two characters. Yeah, right. I think that was the big thing is is the, is is the, that introduction, and I would love to see that opening that scene where Bobby's looking through the scope at. Byron mm-hmm. um, remain in the movie, but after we've established the trauma scene at the beginning of the movie, and then and then you could have him coming out of the studio after announcing his retirement, and then have still have that scene because I think that's a powerful moment. It, it is a good connecting moment. It just wasn't an, there. Were just weren't enough of those connecting moments. Yeah, I'm interested to see if there are any gun shops near uh, studio backlots. But <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. Yeah, I, in fact, it might be. Not even picking up the gun per se, but just looking through the scope, yeah, and seeing how far he could see. Yeah, 
Yeah, that could work. Yeah, but something something along those lines, right? Like so just uh, making more points of connection mm-hmm. throughout the movie between the two characters. Yeah, the that inevitability that rule of threes, where you know you know these characters are going to cross paths. Yeah, and actually that that would give us our third one, right? That mm-hmm. opening scene that you've, you've created, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have the that opening scene, then you have the scope scene, and then you have the marquee. Yeah, right. And I think that that would be sufficient. Well, and it's Jenny who talks Byron or makes him see that like, okay, yeah, I'll do that public appearance, yeah. and they, that whole thing would have played out differently if he had. Well, that terrible incident at the theater would still happen whether he, or not he was there, but the ending might have been very different. The ending might have been different. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's Byron who brings that that story to a close. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, go check out the movie uh, if you haven't. It's um, probably a little difficult to find, but you can rent it on YouTube and Amazon on Prime too. On yeah. Prime, yeah. yeah. So there's there's several ways you can find it. Physical copies have been out of print for a while. So actually, I, I've been told you might be able to find it in a in one of those cheap bins at Walmart. <laughs> yeah, like it's b- bundled up with another movie kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those movies that is really difficult to watch, but should be watched. Yeah, I'm really glad I finally got to see this. Uh, it was originally brought to my attention in um, some horror documentary, and I was really fascinated by it because it didn't look like a horror movie, but it was certainly, at least on the uh, Karloff side of the story, was a commentary on the changing world. And that was kind of what the documentary was, the changing nature of horror and how that was affected by the world around it. So. Yeah. No, and it, it, it works, and it's still timely. Like I said, we've t- we said mm-hmm. it no, a number of times is how timely this movie still is. Yeah. This is a good way to ease us into October as well. we still got another episode to go, but, of course, we're going to be doing horror movies all month long for October, and we're going to be joined by some friends because we're also part of the horror convention for your ears called all the horror happening this year the second annual one and there's going to be 31 podcasts dropping over 31 days 31 different podcasts and you can see all of those participating podcasts by following at all the horror 18 on twitter and the hashtag all the horror right that's right and also on facebook now there's a group on facebook there you go um and just search all the horror where it's right there that one's open to every, everyone and it's a little more free form this is where we want people to have discussions about horror and and share their horror loves and likes and memories and all that fun stuff also make sure that you check out the t public store there are uh, a number of t-shirt designs that are available. Every penny made by the t-shirt designs is going to Scares That Care. Uh, so please buy a t-shirt. There's three designs available now. And by the time you hear this, there are probably five. Yeah, so support a really good cause. It's a children's charity, right? Yeah, uh, It is, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. uh, uh, supported by our, our friend Kane Hodder. Oh, excellent. Yes, so so highly recommend doing that. Go, go ahead and, and purchase a shirt. You get a cool shirt. You support a charity. Who can go wrong? Yeah, so it's T Public slash users slash all the horror i believe but if you just go to t public and search all the horror all is one word it'll come right up there you go very very cool yeah go buy some merch and uh support that charity and uh make sure you follow at all the horror 18 on twitter and uh, the facebook group to get in and all the fun that's going to happen all october and of course we'll be part of that and we'll be doing uh horror related episode every week for the month of october as well as uh we're we're crazy we're also gonna be watching a horror movie every day for the month of october that we've never seen before as part of our 31 days of horror challenge and that's going to culminate in two-part special in november as we recall our adventures of cinema that we annually do now this will be our fourth one yes it will my wife hates it (laughs) <laughs> I actually got. She actually said something about it this year. She says, "I can't wait until October is already over because she gets a little bit burnt out on all the horror movies that we watch." Pardon the pun, but <laughs> <laughs> does wear her down a little bit. She doesn't love it quite as much as as I do. <laughs> well, we love it, and we know you guys love it too. Support us by telling your friends and family where to find us. We're in a ton of different places. You can follow us at Invasion the Remake on Twitter, Invasion the Remake on Facebook and Instagram, and Invasion the Remake at gmail.com if you want to email us. Send us your suggestions, your corrections, your comments. Just say hi. It's fine. And we always respond. Always. We do. 
right? Yeah. Even if it's just with a smiley face, we'll still respond. Yeah, you'll either get a thumbs up or you'll get a comment. Yeah. <laughs> Depends if I think there's a conversation ready to be had there. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And same with Twitter. I, if, if you comment, I'll always acknowledge it somehow. Yeah, and on Instagram. We have a, a couple people who like to talk to us on Instagram, and, and yeah, I always try to reply. And you're not talking to some some handler. You're talking to us directly. So uh, let us know what you like, what you don't like, and, well, mostly what you like. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> and uh, make sure you tell your friends and family where to find us. We're in a ton of different places. You can find that on our link tree, but, of course, we're on Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Google Play Music, TuneIn Radio, Player FM, Blueberry, Radio Public, Radio.com, the app, and even freaking YouTube. YouTube. So no excuses. We're everywhere. The invasion has begun. It began it's, four years ago. It's well underway. It's well underway. Whether you know it or not, the invasion has happened. <laughs> and continues to happen. And you've lost. Have they? Have they really? <laughs> you can only win by listening to Invasion of the Ring. Exactly. <laughs> All right, well, I think that's it for Target 1968. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. and uh, Thank well, you for toughing it out. Thanks thanks for toughing it out on the soapbox there a little bit. And uh, we get that this is a controversial subject, and not everybody wants to hear it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah. that is your option. We gave you fair warning at the beginning, so I don't want to see any complaints later on. Yeah, it, if, if you made it this far, thank you. Thank you. But we'll be back with something uh, next week. We'll do a comparison. I haven't thought of what it's going to be yet, so we'll find out because that'll be our last one before we get into our October recordings. Yeah, we'll. We'll catch you next week. I'm Jason. I'm always Sam. And she continues to be Trish. She's on a plane on the way home as we speak. Well, within 24 hours of me speaking, but she'll be back next week. We are out of here. Once upon a time, many, many years ago, a rich merchant in Baghdad sent his servant to the marketplace to buy provisions. And after a while, the servant came back white-faced and trembling and said, Master, when I was in the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd and I turned to look and I saw that it was death that had jostled. And she looked at me and made a threatening gesture. Oh, master, please lend me your horse that I may ride away from this city and escape my fate. I will ride to Samara and death will not find me there. So the merchant loaned him the horse and the servant mounted it and dug his spurs into its flank and as fast as the horse could gallop, he rode towards Samara. Then the merchant went to the marketplace and he saw Death standing in the crowd and he said to her, Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant when you saw him this morning? And Death said, I made no threatening gesture. That was, that was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him here in Baghdad. For I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. <laughs> <laughs>